Okay, good morning. Um, so this is my second uh, set of lectures. Last, on Monday, we looked at, I introduced the idea of, of sea ice, but more or less as an example of a solidifying system, and want to talk to you uh, sort of more broadly about how things turn from liquid to solid. Uh, and on Monday, everything I spoke about was talking about pure melts, pure water turning into ice. And today I want to think about two component or uh, binary melts. And um, one of the things we're going to find is that very quickly the uh, solid liquid interface uh, is going to be unstable. And we saw that on Monday if we are cooling into supercooled melts, which is not something we commonly do. So pure melts, uh, we're generally not dealing with. Uh, we're generally dealing with planar interfaces, but as we'll see with uh, two-component melts or multi-component melts, much more commonly, we're going to be dealing with mushy layers. And here's an example here. And this is, uh, I mean, it's a different salt, but uh, it's very similar to what was in the plastic bag, actually. So the material in the plastic bag, now full disclosure, was a, a solution of sodium acetate. So two component melts, sodium acetate and water. The solid uh, crystals that formed were sodium acetate crystals, and uh, there was uh, some water left behind. And as someone observed, uh, there was a front, a sort of visible front, that was quite smooth. And you can sort of imagine here uh, as the front. And so unlike uh, Ken yesterday, I'm not going to be interested in all the beautiful shapes down here, but only the simple shape uh, up here of uh, the envelope. And we're going to try and get a description of that. So just coming back briefly to uh, sea ice, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, today. On Monday, we uh, looked at thermodynamic, or just thermal considerations, and uh, found out how we could determine this thickness as a function of time. Just thinking about heat transport and, importantly, the Stefan condition that tells us about heat conservation at this moving interface between solid and liquid, which uh, in many situations determines the rate of advance. Uh, today, if we're talking about real seawater, um, the seawater is salty dominantly sodium chloride. And uh, what we're going to find is that the ice crystals that form are essentially pure ice. Uh, and so the salt has to go somewhere. And ultimately, uh, some of the salt, at least, uh, goes into the ocean. And so we're going to ask the question, how does the, uh, see, uh, how does the salt uh, get out of this region which uh, is predominantly ice, uh, into the ocean. So that's going to be a... So we're going to have to worry about salt today, and I've brought some salt uh, with me, um, and I've also brought some ice with me, um, and a thermometer. Uh, it used to have a beautiful uh, thermometer that I could put on an overhead projector, uh, but now I have a much more sophisticated talking thermometer. Uh, there's just one component missing. Um, I'd like to come up and... Okay, so this thermometer will uh, <laughs> tell you what the temperature is. 0 0.5 degrees. Okay, so a little warm, uh, actually maybe not a terribly expensive thermometer. Uh, and I'm going to take some uh, warm salt, room temperature salt, and uh, add this to the, uh, to the ice. Uh, we might have to uh, wait a little bit. Um, it's not terribly responsive, uh, but you can tell us what's happening. <laughs> it's an emotive thermometer. It's even better, I think. <laughs> So the temperature is going down. I'm going to leave you there for a, a, a little bit um, <laughs> uh, in case it gets even more exciting. Uh, so any time you get excited, just shout out, just uh, over the top. 
Okay. So what we're seeing is that, uh, well, what you're not, no, no, please uh, stay there. It's not, not finished. Um, what's also happening, we can't see, but we know it uh, because this is what we do, uh, you know, in icy countries, unlike uh, Corsica, uh, we often put salt on uh, the roads. Uh, and the colloquial expression is we put salt on the roads to melt the ice. So the solid ice turns into liquid, and then it can be taken away by the tires. But what I want to convince you of today, that the ice is not melting, but it's dissolving. And this is not just a, 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 a lesson in English language. It's a lesson in, I think, scientific language. And we're going to try and understand the distinction between melting and dissolving. And we're used to the idea that salt dissolves in water. I want to say that ice dissolves in salt water. Okay, we'll see the condition. Yeah, we're good. We might do one more. Um, okay, so it's turning into liquid, and um, we've seen this briefly uh, in a previous lecture um, by one of the other lecturers. And um, the idea is that the system of salt and water uh, ice on this side, water up here, can remain liquid, can be liquid, at temperatures below the freezing temperature of the water. So uh, if this is pure water, Tm is zero degrees Celsius at standard atmospheric pressure. Um, and as we add salt to the system, that freezing temperature is depressed. In other words, the system remains liquid to lower temperatures. And this phase diagram is symmetric, by the way. We could start on the salt side, and if we heat the salt sufficiently, we can melt the salt, actually at around 801 Celsius. Uh, but if we add water to the system, we can keep the system molten to lower temperatures. And these two curves, which are called liquidus curves, freezing curves, um, meet at the so-called eutectic concentration which is the minimum temperature at any concentration that you can have a system that is liquid. Um, so you abandon this a little early. Minus 13.8, okay, 13.9. So quite dramatic. If um, it won't get much lower, probably, uh, we'll see. Um, this is a record so far for any of my lectures uh, because, of course, in addition to the salt uh, depressing the freezing temperature, we're in a warm environment, and that will start to warm the system up. Uh, if we insulated this completely, uh, then we would get down to this eutectic temperature, which is about minus 21. Okay. And this, by the way, is how the Romans kept their meat fresh. Uh, they collect snow in the mountains, uh, mix it with salt, and pack it around uh, their meat storage containers. Uh, so we have an elementary uh, deep freeze here. Okay, so two important uh, statements I want to make. First of all, the freezing temperature, temperature below which uh, we can't be purely liquid anymore. Uh, the liquidus temperature is a function of composition. I'm always going to talk about salt um, water, but these ideas are completely symmetric okay. um, and apply to other, uh, other materials as well. The other thing that's different, so what happens when we cool we're liquid, liquid, liquid until we reach this liquidus temperature. If we cool below the liquidus temperature, we're going to start to form a solid. And if we're on the left of the liquidus concentration, the solid that we form is the solid that's over here. And the, in general, you'll form a solid of some composition. In the case of ice uh, and salt, that um, solid concentration will be essentially pure. And as far as anyone's been able to measure so far, uh, this concentration is below 10 to the minus 6, and I think um, anyone would call that 0, practically speaking. And we're going to call it 0. Okay. So the phase diagram for salt and water is a little different to this in the sense that this line here will be vertical and the solid that we form is pure ice. 
Just to complete the story, if we started with a liquid over here at a higher concentration than eutectic and cooled it, we'd reach this liquidus curve, and instead of forming ice, we would crystallize salt out of solution. Okay. So in this region here, we have solid ice and some liquid that's remaining, that's depleted of uh, uh, water, which has gone into the ice, and so is enriched in salt. So if we come down here, then we form this much salt and this much uh, brine left over. The, and the concentration of the brine uh, will be this concentration here given by the liquid. So we restore e equilibrium locally inside this system. Okay? So that's going to be important. Good. So let's, uh, let's do some maths. Enjoy it. So let's imagine for a moment that we can separate the solid completely from the liquid. So we're going to imagine that we start with a salty ocean and we cool it from the top and we form a solid block of pure ice that comes down here. In that case, all the salt has to be rejected from this uh, region that is now ice into the ocean. And there it's going to be transported, and for the moment we're going to imagine that transport is just by diffusion. So the salt field itself has to satisfy the diffusion equation, while the temperature field is also satisfying a diffusion equation. So we saw all of this on Monday. The new ingredient is we have to worry about the salt field, and we have to worry about it in terms of transport, but we have to worry about it also in terms of how this interface moves. So there are two new conditions that we have to worry about. First of all, on Monday, near equilibrium, so we're not worrying about attachment kinetics now, we're not worrying about Gibbs-Thompson, the equilibrium condition that we imposed was that the temperature was equal to the melting temperature. And now we're going to make the same assumption, except that our melting temperature, our freezing temperature, our liquidus temperature, I'll use those terms interchangeably, is a function of the concentration at the interface. Okay. So we have a relationship between the temperature and the salinity at the interface. So we need yet another condition, because this, this is not completely specified yet, and that comes from an equivalent to the Stefan condition, namely conservation of salt at this moving interface. And in heat terms, this was a r rate of release of latent heat related to a, fl a heat flux. And here we've got the uh, concentration difference between the interface and the ice, the jump in salinity, is replacing the jump in enthalpy. Remember, it's the jump in enthalpy is the latent heat. So we used to have a jump in enthalpy, it's now the jump in salinity, times the rate of advance of the interface is equal to the flux away from the interface. And here we're just thinking about a diffusive flux, so a down gradient flux, minus dc by dz. Okay. So now we have a complete problem. Minus 14.5. Doing really well. Um, sorry? It is my record, yeah. Getting better at this. <laughs> it's Corsican ice. It's very high quality ice. That's, uh, um, Good, so here's uh, a problem. So I'll mention it just briefly so you know what you're looking at, but I don't want to dwell on it on this slide. Um, a convenient way of plotting concentration in this context is in the liquid is to plot the freezing temperature of the liquid. Remember the freezing temperature of the liquid is a function of concentration, so if I know the concentration, I know the liquid is temperature. So I, rather than plotting concentration, I'm going to tend to plot liquidus temperature, plot the freezing temperature. And I'll come back to the importance of that just now. 
For now, I'm not going to go through uh, the mathematics, um, but we saw on Monday how we could solve the diffusion equation using error functions. We can solve the salt diffusion equation also in terms of error functions. Here is the solution for your reference for uh, the concentration and for the temperature. The only thing I want you to take from this slide is the fact that the length scale for the uh, concentration field, the length scale over which the concentration decays to its far field value, looks like the square root of the salt diffusivity times time. Whereas the relaxation scale, the scale over which the temperature field relaxes to its far, far field value, is the square root of the thermal diffusivity times time. Uh, I think it's on my next slide. Uh, these two are very different from each other. I should have had it on this slide. Let me write it here. D over kappa for salt uh, is about, nice rule of thumb, about 10 to the minus 2. And we're going to treat it as a very small parameter, something that's very small. There's a rather complicated um, uh, relationship to tell you the coefficient in front of this square root of time. But that simplifies if we make this approximation, that the uh, diffusivity of salt is much slower than the diffusivity of heat. And then we get uh, a relatively simple, you may not think that simple, relatively simple expression for this uh, constant of proportionality. The important thing that I want to take you to take away is that this constant of proportionality is order one if we scale the thickness of the ice with the square root of the salt diffusivity. So to express that in physical terms, whereas we found on Monday that a thermally controlled growth of a pure melt turning into solid is uh, proportional to the diffusion length for heat. In this case, the thickness of the ice really scales with the diffusion length for salt. Or another way of saying is transport of salt is rate limiting. The, the growth rate is limited by the rate at which I can take the excess salt away from this interface. So this is this important statement at the end. The growth of a planar solid liquid interface is limited by the rate of removal of solute. Okay. So this has various interesting consequences. The first of which I want to discuss is the distinction between melting and dissolving. And we'll start with melting. Melting happens if the phase change from solid to liquid can occur without transport of salt. So a sort of thought experiment that you can make to decide whether a block of ice is melting or dissolving is to imagine wrapping the ice in tin foil, aluminium foil, and asking the question, will that block of ice still turn into liquid? If the answer is yes, then it's melting, because the only thing that can go through the tin foil is heat and not salt. So if the phase change is, dom is, um, is caused entirely by heat, then uh, we can call that melting. And in that case, the amount of melt that we form uh, is proportional to the rate of um, heat transport proportional to the square root of the thermal diffusivity times time. And we also melt this ice to form a layer of essentially fresh water. And then there's a very rapid transition near the boundary of the freshwater region and the saltwater region. So we really do melt this ice to form fresh water. Okay. On the other hand, suppose I took my ice block and put it into the, uh, into the Arctic Ocean. Okay, at, let's say it's a warm Arctic Ocean at minus one Celsius. Then my thought experiment 
course, says there's no phase change, if I wrap my ice block in tinfoil, because the temperature is minus one, that ice is going to be quite happy staying as ice. If I take the tinfoil off and allow salt to attack the ice, okay, then that ice can dissolve. So that's the picture here. I've now got, um, importantly, uh, the far field temperature is less than the melting temperature, okay, but nevertheless above the liquidus. If it were below the liquidus, all of this would be frozen anyway. So because I've got liquid salt water, we're, we're above the liquidus, but below the melting temperature, I can still cause the solid to turn to liquid, but only if I can provide salt. And so this um, ablation is rate limited by the rate of salt transport and proceeds proportional to the square root of the salt diffusivity uh, times time. Okay. There is, of course, the need to remove a bit of latent heat, but that's not rate limiting, and this temperature difference is quite small. Okay, so a little bit of thermal gradient, but that's what happens. Okay. And here I've put this important ratio, d over kappa, about 10 to the minus 2. So that's one uh, important thing. And now for a sort of cute phenomenon, it also relates to this difference in um, salt transport and heat transport, is uh, in the evolution of under ice melt ponds. So what's that about? Um, here's some sea ice that these people are walking on. This is springtime, and so the uh, surface snow has melted, and it's accumulating in uh, ponds on the top of the ice. Every now and again, these ponds will break through, and this melted snow, which is essentially fresh water, can leak through and collect underneath the ice flow in what's known as an under-ice melt pond. So this is a pond, sort of upside-down pond, of fresh water sitting on top of the uh, ocean. And what happens is because the ocean is cold, this fresh ice will begin to, sorry, the fresh water will begin to freeze to form a layer of ice. So this dark blue layer is a layer of ice, which I've expanded here. This is the fresh water in the pond from here. And uh, that ice will grow at a rate dictated by heat transport. On the other hand, that ice is immediately in contact with salt water, which is going to cause it to dissolve at the bottom. And if those rates were not different, in particular if the rate of freezing were not much faster than the rate of dissolution, then we wouldn't see anything. But the fact that uh, the salt transport is much slower than the heat transport means that this layer of ice can grow at its upper surface while it's dissolving at its lower surface. And uh, there were some nice experiments by Seely Martin on this, who described this layer of ice migrating upwards. Of course, if you followed a piece of ice, it wasn't going anywhere, okay? But the layer was growing at the top and dissolving at the bottom. So there was the appearance of it migrating upwards. So that's just a sort of cute observation. Um, that's related to this mismatch in uh, diffusivities. Uh, Seely Martin. Uh, so Martin is the last name, M-A-R-T-I-N, um, and Seely, S-E-E-L-Y-E. -E. Yeah. Very nice pon uh, paper called On the Evolution of Under Ice Melt Ponds. So the most important consequence of this mismatch between salt diffusion and thermal diffusion is the generation of what's called constitutional supercooling. So on Monday, when we were talking about pure melts, we had to be very deliberate and very careful about cooling our liquid down to a temperature below its freezing temperature. 
and then we initiated a crystal and it could grow. With a binary system, we don't have to be careful at all. We can start with seawater. The seawater, the sea is not frozen in its bulk, and so it's sitting above the liquidus, uh, not in a metastable state, but in a stable state. But if we start to freeze it and reject some salt, that salt doesn't go very far compared with the thermal sig signal. And as you can see from this picture, the consequence is that there's a region of liquid here where the temperature is less than the local freezing temperature. It's very important. At the interface, the temperature is equal to the freezing temperature, but because the freezing temperature changes rapidly and the actual temperature doesn't, we end up with this region where the temperature is below the freezing temperature. And so we have generated supercooling by this uh, slow transport of salt relative to heat. Okay. And because it's caused fundamentally by the salt, uh, this is called constitutional supercooling. Okay. And we can see from this picture that that's going to happen if the temperature gradient is less than the gradient in the freezing temperature. Okay. So we'll get constitutional supercooling the temperature gradient's less than the freezing temperature. And, oh, let me write that on the blackboard. Um, and I should have said this earlier. We had a phase diagram which looked like this, generally with our liquidus curve. And for mathematical convenience, and I'll keep my slides a bit cleaner, uh, we're going to approximate that with this, okay? So our freezing curve, TL, is going to be TM minus some constant times the salinity, okay? So that's just a convenient approximation. And so the slope of the freezing temperature is minus the liquid slope, M, times the concentration gradient. And if we take those similarity solutions that I showed you earlier, we can uh, put it into this relationship, and we find that we get constitutional supercooling if the undercooling, so this is the boundary temperature, how far the boundary temperature is below the freezing temperature, or liquidus temperature, uh, provided that's greater than this expression here, this is an order one quantity, and this is proportional to the square root of this diffusivity ratio, which, remember, is very small. That tells me that we're going to be constitutionally supercooled almost in all circumstances. We're going to be very careful, to an extent that nature usually isn't, to avoid constitutional supercooling happening. So constitutional supercooling, I would think, say, is the typical uh, state of, uh, of, uh, of the world in nature. Okay. So what are the consequences of that? We, on Monday, we, I took you through a somewhat detailed stability analysis to show that the growth into a supercooled melt was morphologically unstable. I'm not going to repeat that today but we'll, uh, I hope you'll take away the idea that if we have supercooling here, constitutional supercooling, then um, uh, we will get morphological instability. Okay. That's not an absolutely precise statement, but it's a good enough statement uh, for our purposes. Yeah, so we're essentially doing that here because we have the Stefan condition, which is really telling us about whether it's exothermic or endothermic, okay? Because this, the latent heat, remember, is the difference in enthalpy between solid and liquid. And it's that difference in enthalpy which is positive or negative 
depending on whether you're exothermic or endothermic. Okay. It would change it completely. Actually, if it were, um, if it were endothermic, then you wouldn't get um, morphological instability. So we're talking about situations where you need to um, add heat to turn solid to liquid. Okay? Or the freezing process uh, is exothermic, which is what we felt on, on Monday. It will change it a little bit. Yeah, it, it changes the value a little bit. But, yeah. Ah. Ah. Well, as we, <laughs> as I explained on Monday, uh, homogeneous nucleation is very, very difficult. Heterogeneous nucleation is easier, so actually the heterogeneous nucleation. But also the stability calculation we did on Monday had T equals Tm at the interface. The undercooling only happened away from the interface. Okay, and it's the gradient that matters. It's the fact that you're going from equilibrium to disequilibrium as you move away from the interface. Uh, causes and I could go. We could go through the the maths, but you know, for sake of time, I, I won't do that. But sorry, uh, we'll we'll get to that right now. Okay, so that that is the important consequence. Um, so this basically says if I cool very gently, so if I if my undercooling is small, I might escape and keep this interface planar, but if, uh, you know, in typical nature situations or in the laboratory, if I make this undercooling larger, larger than this quantity, then I will get morphological instability. Okay. So let's see if that's the case. So here is an experiment. Um, first of all, this is not a quantitative experiment. Uh, it was just done for illustration. Everything I've said about water and salt usually applies for any impurity, water and impurity. And here, for visual reasons, uh, my impurity is, uh, it's interest to Silver, my impurity here is uh, bentonite uh, clay particles. Okay, but it's sort of dirty water. Um, and uh, we'll see a video in just a minute, but just to get your eye in, the blue color here is a solid ice. All the particles have been rejected from the ice and are accumulating ahead of it, uh, very similar to uh, the video that um, Sylvain showed us yesterday. So let's run that video. We can see the ice uh, can grow upwards. This is time lapse, obviously, 30 minutes real time is what we're looking at. And, um, we can push all of that impurity uh, outside of the ice. So here they're particles, but the same is true of salt, and we would form this nice crystal of um, pure ice, and all the salt goes into a boundary layer in, in the liquid region. Okay. But if I decrease the temperature of the, the bottom of this cell, so I have a larger undercooling, uh, then the growth is faster, and um, there it goes. Uh, so somewhere down there, there was a morphological instability, and what the consequence is that I form this porous medium. Uh, so we form a structure, which is called a mushy layer, uh, of solid uh, ice dendrites, if you like, with the impurity mostly contained in the spaces between the dendrites. There is a little bit of impurity ahead, and I'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. Um, mostly, it's accommodated in the interstices, okay, in the spaces between the uh, ice crystals. Okay. Good. So this is the, I would say, the natural course of events in systems like uh, the ocean and sea ice. So. We have a paper called this, Sea Ice is a Mushy Layer. 
um, to try and introduce that community to these ideas. Um, this is a, a picture, by the way, of uh, artificial sea ice grown in uh, our laboratory. So this is uh, frozen salt water looking um, end on. So this is if you were looking up at the bottom of the sea ice, uh, which grew down from the top of the tank. This is a different system, actually, with the other side of the liquidus. So we're um, crystallizing salt rather than freezing ice. Uh, but we get the same sort of instabilities happening. Uh, and uh, we form this region of mixed phase. Okay. So what is a mushy layer? It's a region of mixed phase, two phases, solid and liquid. Um, in our case, we're going to worry only about two components, water and salt. In many geological contexts, you, for example, you have to worry about many components, many mineral components. Uh, but we'll restrict our attention to two components. And we're going to find out mostly on Friday that this is a reactive porous medium. That the liquid in between these solid uh, crystals uh, can still flow. So we're going to worry about the flow of that uh, fluid through this porous medium. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, we're not going to try to follow the morpholo morphology. And as you can see here, the morphologies can vary enormously uh, depending on the, the chemical system that you're dealing with. So in the case of ice, one tends to form platelets. Uh, in the, this is, this is happens to be ammonium chloride crystals. Uh, the structures are much more dendritic uh, in character. We're going to be completely agnostic about the microstructure and take this averaged view, where in addition to following the temperature and the concentration of the liquid in between the solid phases, uh, we're going to worry only about the volume occupied by solid, the volume fraction of solid. So that's going to be our new dependent variable that we're going to try and predict uh, as it varies through this mushy layer. And on Friday, we will talk more about the flow through this porous medium, and we'll worry about what's called the Darcy velocity through that medium. OK, so that gets me to really the first generation of sea ice models. I mentioned it very briefly on Monday to say, um, actually still in many GCMs, uh, this is the level of uh, modeling that's used, where we take a linear temperature profile through the sea ice, the only acknowledgement to the fact that this is not solid ice is um, in determining its thermal conductivity. Okay. The thermal conductivity is an average between the conductivity of solid ice and liquid water. And um, why you have to take that into account is there's a factor of five. Uh, Ice is five times more conductive than water. It also has only half the heat capacity. And so the difference in diffusivity, in kappa, is a factor of 10 between ice and water. Okay. So that's related. Uh, the mean conductivity uh, depends on the volume fraction of ice, phi. Okay. That's our new variable. Uh, but we're just going to take a linear profile and use our usual. Uh, so this is our quasi-stationary approximation, quasi-steady approximation with a conductivity that depends on phi. And phi is an adjustable parameter, very typical in GCMs. There are parameters all over the place, and you sort of tune your parameters to give you good fits with, with other data. Or sometimes phi is taken from historical uh, field measurements. You dig up some sea ice and, OK, well, phi is about this, and I'm going to use this uh, going forward. Okay. And I don't want to be disparaging about this, because actually, this level of modeling does almost everything you want uh, from the thermal point of view. If you want to know about the growth rate of sea ice, just how thick it is as a function of time, this will get you most of the way. It's a reasonable accuracy, 
Uh, so, so far, far yes. 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 Uh, you, should you should be surprised. Be um, <laughs> the reason it works so well is actually a sort of accident of uh, faith. It's because, so I said that uh, K is much larger than, KS is much larger than KL. Okay. Also, phi is relatively large in sea ice. So we're talking about sea ice in particular. And it means that this K bar is almost phi times KS. So you might think, well, I still have to worry about phi. But if I replace K bar by phi KS in here, then the phi's cancel. So that's the happy accident. And then this uh, rate of increase in thickness really is independent of this parameter phi that I've introduced. So that's why it works so well. Okay. However, what it doesn't do is to tell us anything about the rate of salt transport. And that's a very important property to tell you about uh, the driving force for convection in the ocean. And that's the thing that we're going to spend Friday worrying about. Okay. So, um, I haven't got a slide on this. The next level of sophistication is what's called a one-layer Sempner model. And that simply puts another one grid point in the middle of the sea ice. And that's actually an important improvement uh, not so much for the overall growth, but in getting the right phase lag between changes in atmospheric temperature and changes in the rate of growth. Okay? So this model, this uh, the sort of physical feature of this steady, quasi-steady approximation, is it doesn't take into account the heat capacity of the sea ice. Okay? So heat capacity is like a storage radiator sort of holds on to the heat for a while before letting it go. Okay, by adding one point in here, you can capture that heat capacity and you can get the right phase relationships as during the seasonal variations. Uh, if we're worried about, uh, sorry, you're talking about the roughness here. Yes? Yeah, you don't need to, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding completely your concern. So there's the roughness of your plate, your cold plate, and that will help to, that will help to nucleate. Actually, it's a problem even in our laboratory. You know, we had rather nice polished um, copper plates or brass plates, um, and you, know, you had some delay in nucleation, which meant you had to supercool for a while before you nucleated some crystals, and then you got some bounce back. So the roughness will help to initiate growth. It won't change the velocity at all. Sorry, it will have an effect on uh, convective velocities layer down, so the roughness of the bottom of the sea ice can have an influence on motion, uh, ocean flows. But that's a slightly different question. Okay. So this was first generation, second generation is the one layer Sempner model. Um, then around, uh, I want to say around the turn of this century, but uh, you know, it's, uh, we're going back to two decades roughly people started introducing into the climate models uh, so-called thermodynamic models of uh, sea ice. Basically, that just put more grid points into the sea ice. And when I say more grid points, typically four or six. Okay. But uh, once you've got those extra grid points, what do you do with them? Actually, you solve a heat equation. And this is our first equation describing, the uh, first one I'm introducing you to, describing the interior of a mushy layer. So it's essentially a diffusion equation. We're not worrying about flow yet. We'll worry about that on Friday. 
Um, we have to worry, as I've shown on the previous slide, uh, how the conductivity varies with um, solid fraction and how the specific heat capacity depends on solid fraction. But here's an important new term which says that if I change the volume fraction of solid inside this mushy layer, so I'm increasing the amount of solid, I have to have turned liquid into solid, and so there needs to be a release of latent heat. Just like in those plastic bags, there was a release of latent heat, and it's a volume source of heat into this equation. So that's the new term. However, we can accommodate it quite simply if we assume that in the interior we have essentially restored local equilibrium, we've pushed the temperature back onto the freezing curve, the liquidus, then we can relate the temperature to the concentration of the liquid in between the crystals. Now, when People talk about the salinity of sea ice. They're not talking about the salinity of the liquid phase only. They're talking about taking a bucket and gathering up a lot of sea ice, which has solid and liquid in it, melting the whole lot, mixing it up, and measuring the salinity of that. So that's really the bulk concentration. And because there's no salt in the ice, the solid ice, that's just equal to the liquid fraction, which is 1 minus the solid fraction, times the concentration of the liquid phase. Okay. And we can invert this relationship to say that the solid fraction is 1 minus the bulk concentration over the pore concentration. Okay. So let's put these together. Let's suppose for the moment that we fix the bulk concentration, and I'll show you that you can run experiments like that. Um, or what's done in climate models, actually even given this sophistication, if you go to the actual climate models, they do this. They actually take um, historic profiles of um, uh, bulk salinity concentrations and say, well, this is what sea ice looks like. And so they use this, essentially, and then the bulk concentration is a function of position only, then I can worry about this term, d phi dt, I can get from here, d phi dt is 1 over c squared dc dt, and I can relate um, dc dt to the rate of change of the temperature because the concentration and temperature are tied by the liquidus. So I can relate changes in the solid fraction to changes in the temperature field. The consequence is that this term, the rate of release of latent heat, comes onto the left-hand side of the equation and acts as an additional thermal inertial, uh, inertia, an additional heat capacity. So let's just remind ourselves what heat capacity is about. Heat capacity is the amount of heat I need to add to a material to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius. Okay. If you want to raise the temperature of sea ice, you want to raise the temperature of a mushy layer by one degree Celsius, you not only have to provide sensible heat to the solid phase and to the liquid phase, you are also, by increasing the temperature, going to melt some of the, or dissolve, some of the solid, and so you're going to release some latent heat. So you have to add more heat to the system to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, because you have to add latent heat in addition. So this rate of release of latent heat here acts as an additional heat capacity. And that was the, you know, this was really the addition and also by taking this, uh, you know, several points, you get over this um, seasonal lag. Uh, you deal with the heat capacity. But you're still parameterizing the system, but uh, this time parameterizing it with a profile of uh, salinity.
Yep. yep. Depends what you want the quest the answer to. It's a good approximation to calculating the thickness. Thickness actually is relatively easy to calculate. We haven't yet got to brine fluxes. The problem really was, and this is where we'll get to on Friday, is this was used as an approximation to get the thermal field right, but the same or related approximation was made to compute the salt flux. And that isn't a good approximation. In fact, it gives you, um, there's something called the Baltic Sea problem, uh, where basically the climate models give you the wrong sign of the salt flux in the Baltic Sea. Um, I'll tell you. Okay, um, but we'll get to that. So let's uh, see if we can at least test out this equation. Uh, so we're going to run an experiment in which we know that uh, the bulk concentration is not changing in time. And we do that by growing sea ice upside down. Okay, so instead of uh, cooling the atmosphere and, and growing, the, uh, growing the ice downwards, we're going to take a tank of salt water and uh, cool it from the bottom and grow the mushy layer upwards. Because we're cold below and warm above, there's no tendency for thermal convection. Also, because we're taking the ice out of the system, uh, we're making the uh, water more salty and therefore more dense. We've got the more dense water at the bottom relative to the top, so again, there's no tendency for convection. So this is a system which is governed entirely by diffusion, and it's easy enough uh, to measure the envelope of uh, this as a function of time. I could show you more data, but um, it's very uh, you can confirm that this, this interface grows like the square root of time. There is another theoretical interface between a layer of pure solid and mush. So we have solid, we have mush, and we have liquid. This solid layer is very thin. And so from from our, p in our lab, uh, we don't measure things that are very small. Uh, this was not measurable uh, for us, okay? But we measured this interface, and we'd run it over many different conditions, so you can measure this coefficient, and here is that coefficient uh, against the theory, the theory that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so the full uh, mushy layer theory uh, for that coefficient as you vary the base temperature, or as you vary the salinity of uh, the uh, original solution. Okay. Good, and that uh, leads me to a temporary summary. Um, we'll take a break. What we've seen uh, on Monday, actually, is that thermally controlled solidification uh, has length scales proportional to the square root of the thermal diffusivity times time, but a planar solid-liquid interface into a a multi-component melt is rate limited by the rate of removal of salt, and therefore scales like the square root of the salt diffusivity times time. Uh, but the consequence of this difference is that you generate constitutional supercooling and hence um, the generation of a mushy layer. And uh, we've seen that mathematical models of mushy layers give accurate predictions of their evolution. Once you know their salinity, but what actually determines that salinity? Um, we're not going to do very much more today. Uh, what we saw in the first half was that um, with, uh, if we're solidifying a mixture, the typical situation is that we form a mushy layer rather than a, a solid block uh, because of the morphological instabilities that occur. And we found that we can determine the thickness of the mushy layer and the thermal field within it uh, really very accurately, um, uh, provided that we know the um, uh, salinity. Okay. And the big question is what determines the salinity of sea ice. And uh, actually, if you read the sea ice literature, you will find uh, these five different mechanisms uh, talked about. And I'm going to take you through each of those. We're going to do these three.
fairly quickly um, in this uh, section today. Uh, fairly quickly because they, I'm going to uh, put my the colors on the mast. Um, they're all negligible okay, during growth of sea ice. And then on Friday, we will spend the whole lecture pretty much talking about this one, which is the most important one. Um, it's the one Sylvain uh, mentioned uh, because of gravity. Um, how does the salt move around under the action of gravity? And then I'll very briefly mention flushing um, on Friday as well. OK, so let's start with the first of these, which is interfacial fractionation. Um, so this is a, a concept from metallurgy, really, that there's a fractionation coefficient or a distribution coefficient that tells you the difference between the uh, liquid concentration and the solid concentration at the interface. Um, what that translates into, really, is a difference in concentration between the bulk that we're freezing from and what's in the mushy layer. And as you saw from the video earlier, there is a little bit of uh, pushing of impurity, salt, or whatever, ahead of the mushy layer. Um, let's uh, look locally, because we're interested in, in this local phenomenon, uh, locally to the interface, and imagine the interface is moving with speed v. We saw earlier that we're going to apply this equilibrium constraint, that the temperature is equal to the local freezing temperature, or liquidus temperature and they both uh, decay into the far field. When we had solid liquid, these curves overlapped and we generated some constitutional supercooling. What the mushy layer does is it grows into that region of supercooling, releasing latent heat, which reduces the supercooling. And the approximation that is made is that the mushy layer grows sufficiently to eliminate the supercooling. And so instead of coming out at a different gradient, the temperature comes out at a gradient that's equal to the gradient in the uh, freezing temperature. And that's a condition that's called marginal equilibrium. It's a, a, an assumption, um, but it seems to give very good predictions. Okay. And so we can take our local fields, we can apply this conditional of marginal equilibrium, the temperature gradient is equal to the gradient in the local freezing temperature, and um, uh, we can relate that to the salt field okay, through the liquidus uh, curve. And if we take these expressions and put them here, I'm not going to go through all the steps. Uh, this is here for your later reference. What we find out is that the difference between the interfacial concentration, the concentration here, and the concentration at infinity, in other words, what's the concentration difference across this boundary layer, ci minus c infinity, we find that it is, has a size that is scales with epsilon, epsilon being this ratio of diffusivities, which is about 10 to the minus 2. Okay. So this interfacial fractionation really, if we're worrying about sea ice at least, uh, is negligible, and we're going to neglect it. Okay. So that's the first process. The second process. Uh, oh, sorry. Where did we get to? Second process is what's referred to as brine expulsion. And the idea here is that when water turns into ice, it expands a bit. Actually, by about 10%. And um, that expansion will cause the liquid region to be squeezed a bit. It'll cause a flow uh, within the liquid phase. And that can happen in the interior of the mushy layer. As the solid fraction increases, you cause an expansion, and that has to push the liquid out. And we can do a uh, conservation of mass. Remember, our conservation law says that the rate of change of the density of stuff is plus the divergence of stuff is zero. In this case, our stuff is mass. So the rate of change of the mass density plus the divergence of the mass flux is equal to zero. 
And in our mushy layer, the mass density overall is this uh, weighted average of the densities of the solid and the liquid. Density of ice is less than the density of liquid. We have to worry about the volume of ice here. So this is just conservation of mass. We can rearrange this equation and find out that the divergence of the velocity field, actually this is the Darcy flux, which I'll talk more about on Friday. Uh, it's the volume flux per unit area uh, of uh, mush. A divergence which we normally think of as being equal to zero in fluid mechanics uh, because of incompressibility. The divergence of the velocity field is proportional to the rate of change of the solid fraction um, and is non-zero if the density of solid is different from the density of the liquid. And in particular, let's just confirm our physical intuition, if density of ice is less than the density of water, this ratio is less than one, this bracket is positive, and it says if my volume fraction is increasing inside the mushy layer, then there will be a divergence of the velocity field. The velocity is being squeezed, the, the liquid is being squeezed out. This actually is a very easy flow to incorporate within the previous equations. I'm not going to take it, you through it. It doesn't destroy the self-similarity. One can find similarity solutions again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All I want to show you is that, um, first of all, you need it if you really want to capture experimental uh, observations. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the experiments. Uh, this was a, a little instrument that we um, developed to take to the field, actually. Uh, it was deployed for the first time in Svalbard in 2001 um, to measure the uh, solid fraction phi directly uh, in sea ice. And it's simply a, a conductivity probe, an AC uh, conductivity probe. Uh, we have uh, platinum wires. This thing's about 14 centimeters across, a pair of platinum wires, and we measure the uh, impedance uh, uh, between those two wires. Um, and basically, the conductivity is dominated by uh, ion transport in the brine. Uh, there's no uh, electrical conductivity in the ice itself. And so this gives you a measure uh, pretty much directly of the uh, solid fraction. And in the laboratory, these circles are um, taken from a single experiment, but because you have a self-similar profile, you can take um, measurements at different times and map those onto a spatial structure. So this is giving you, uh, so you just have to normalize the position with the thickness of the mushy layer. And that gives you this uh, profile. And that's, remember, that was our new dependent variable. Phi was an we have to worry about in addition to temperature and concentration. So you now have three dependent variables, temperature, concentration, and solid fraction. We can make predictions of solid fraction. If you ignore brine expulsion, you get the dashed curve. If you take the correct value, this is not a fitted value. It is the value of uh, this ratio. Uh, you may worry that this is 0.74 rather than 0.92. Of course, 0.92 is the value it would have if you had pure water and ice. But this is salty water, which is denser, so rho s is larger. Um, so it's the density of salty water divided by the density of ice. For this experiment, was 0.74. And uh, if you take that into account in the theory, you get the solid curve, uh, which goes pretty nicely through, through the data. So that's nice. Uh, brine expulsion is real, um, and you need to take it into account if you really want uh, to get accurate uh, uh, predictions of that solid fraction profile. However, because of the, if you uh, still believe in, as I do, um, if you still believe in marginal equilibrium at the mushy layer, if you squeeze your brine through the mushy layer to the edge, that just allows the mushy layer to grow a little bit further. Okay. What it doesn't do 
is expel salt from the interior of the mushy layer into the ocean. So you extend the mushy layer to accommodate the extra salt that's been pushed. You don't actually inject salt into the ocean. So although this is called brine expulsion, it doesn't expel brine into the ocean. And that's an important. Um, so you redistribute brine through the mushy layer. It's important, but it doesn't expel brine. OK, so the third uh, mechanism by which you can change salinity, we've heard a little bit about already. And that's this idea of brine pocket migration. Uh, and there have been you know, theories for this for a long time. I'm going to take, it, uh, take you through it uh, a little bit in, in a particular way. Um, I don't quite like the terminology in the context of sea ice because it reinforces the idea that many people have that the brine in sea ice is contained in pockets. And I actually think that the brine in sea ice is mostly connected all the time. So it's not encapsulated in pockets, but it's connected. Now, actually, that doesn't matter. It doesn't change the rate of transport of salt, the old, your microscopic picture. So what I'm going to do first on this slide is just take you through essentially the classical argument for a pocket of brine moving through a block of ice. And on the next slide, we're going to go through a calculation that's completely agnostic about the morphology of uh, or connectivity of uh, the brine, uh, where the brine is. Okay. So the idea, in essence, is very simple. It says that if I have uh, brine in a pocket uh, sitting in a temperature gradient, at the interface here, we're going to assume equilibrium, near equilibrium, that the salinity of this brine on this side of the interface um, should be, on the, uh, be at the liquidus concentration given the local temperature. So the temperature and the concentration are related by the phase diagram. Okay? And then, I could have included more lines, probably, and, uh, and more mathematics. But essentially, if uh, diffusion happens faster than the rate of migration, and one can look after the fact to make sure that's a reasonable approximation, then all you have in the interior here is not a solution to the diffusion equation, but a solution to Laplace's equation. And I can't remember, was it Sylvain or? Someone showed us that yesterday. Um, it was Sylvain. Um, showed us some nice uh, illustrations of isotherms coming um, in steady state uh, uh, near an interface. And the steady state isotherm uh, concentration lines will just be uh, vertical here. Okay. In other words, the so we have a, a variation in the temperature, because that's imposed. That gives me a variation in the salinity at the boundary, which turns into a variation in the salinity through the whole uh, brine inclusion. Because it's cold at the bottom and fresher at the top, going from cold to fresh, then we go from salt, sorry, cold to warm, then we go from salty to fresh along the liquidus. So it's saltier at the bottom, fresher at the top. That means that salt wants to diffuse down the concentration gradient from where it's salty to where it's fresh. So we've got a salt flux away from this interface towards this interface. The salt flux away from this interface allows that ice to grow. The salt flux towards this interface dissolves this ice. We're throwing salt onto our roads. Okay. Let me take you through that uh, a little bit quickly. Here's our temperature field. It's just a linear temperature field given this gradient. Uh, G, the gradient is G times the uh, unit vector in the z direction, uh, G dot x. That gives you this 
corresponding salinity from the phase diagram. And then here's our equivalent of the Stefan condition for salt, conservation of salt at the interface. Says that the jump in salinity, from the salinity here to zero in the ice, times the normal velocity is equal to the salt flux at the boundary. We take this expression for our salt field to calculate the salt flux. And then we can rearrange this equation for V. And V looks like dG over M uh, divided by C. And here's an important approximation. We're going to say that the pocket size is much smaller than the size over which my temperature field is varying. Okay, so this is the temperature difference between the middle of the brine uh, pocket, for example, and the, the main phase boundary, which is up here somewhere, uh, Tm, so we're somewhere below Tm, uh, divided by that gradient. So that, that gives us a scale for the pocket size. Provided that's small, then I can approximate this concentration simply by uh, Tm minus T naught over M. Okay. So here's an expression. Uh, one thing that's nice about it is that, um, uh, sorry, this just tells us uh, how quickly this brine pocket will move given the temperature gradient. It's proportional to the temperature gradient. But what we see is it's our small parameter d over kappa times the growth rate of a mushy layer because the growth rate of a mushy layer uh, looks like v over d, uh, v over kappa. Sorry, kappa over the length scale looks like kappa over v. So again, if we're worried about trying to predict the growth of sea ice and processes that are taking place on that time scale, on the growth time scale, then brine pocket migration is a very slow process. Okay, so during the growth of sea ice, the brine doesn't go very far by this mechanism. Okay. So let's see that in a slightly different way. Uh, Let's look at a piece of mush inside a mushy layer, and I'm going to consider a control volume here, um, interior D with a boundary delta D, and look at salt conservation. So the amount of salt in this region, remember there's no salt in the solid phase, no salt in the ice, so we just need the liquid fraction, one minus phi, times the concentration of brine in the interstices. This gives us the bulk concentration, uh, amount of salt per unit volume, and I integrate that over the volume. So this gives me the total amount of salt inside D, and the rate at which that changes is the rate at which um, salt is either advected or diffused into D. Okay. So uh, into means we want minus the outward normal, and then here's our salt flux, both advection and uh, diffusion. And if I first of all take this d by dt inside, uh, then I get uh, 1 minus phi dc dt uh, plus a u dot grad c. I'm sweeping some things under the carpet. This is a mass conservation equation you need to worry about as well. Uh, this is the right final answer. Um, and let me motivate that rather then um, by analogy with the thermal equation. This looks like a diffusion equation, dc by dt, but of course we're only worried about what's happening in the pores, in the interstices. That's why the 1 minus phi is here. Salt can be advected by the flow. It can be diffused but only through the liquid phase, which is why this one minus phi is here. And also, if I change the amount of ice internally, if I change that volume fraction, then I push more salt into the pore spaces. So there's a volume source here proportional to the difference in concentration between the liquid and the solid phase. So that's one way of writing the uh, equation. And this is the form that I'll use it in on uh, Friday. But actually, for today, I'd like to keep it into this form.
which you can get from here either by taking this term over to this term and using the product rule, or you can do directly from here, because what we have, we take the time derivative into here, we really have dCb by dt. Okay. So this is the rate of change of the bulk salinity, what people who deal with sea ice call the salinity. And then this term here, I've replaced grad C with a 1 over M grad T. Okay. And then I've got my D times 1 minus phi. And we have a term here, which is actually the dominant term that we'll talk about on Friday. But for today, I just want to talk about this process, this process that's called brine pocket migration. Um, so we haven't mentioned any pockets here. Um, so we're going to neglect that term and just worry about this diffusive transport. So oh, is that yeah. Let me I'll come to the equations at the moment. And I've said already that I think brine pocket migration is negligible during growth of sea ice. Actually, it's a very important mechanism in a different context. So I just want to make a digression now away from sea ice into a different context, which is the migration of climate signals. And uh, thanks very much to Alan Rempel, who uh, put this graph together for me uh, at short notice on Monday evening or Sunday evening. Or so. um, so this is a graph of some dissolved uh, sulfates, as it happens, taken from an ice core. And those dissolved sulfates sit in the liquid phase uh, that exists in the grain boundary grooves, really, uh, between ice crystals in an ice core. So we've taken an ice core. We're trying to learn something about past climate. And what, to my mind, the most remarkable thing about this signal. If you look at the time scale here, this is in thousands of years, so we're talking about 100,000 years. Diffusion is slow, but it's not that slow. Okay, So here is the diffusion length, the salt diffusion length, for 100,000 years. So the most remarkable thing about this picture to my mind, is that it exists at all. Why is this signal still here after 100,000 years, given that the diffusion length is much bigger than any of these wiggles? Why isn't it all smoothed out? And the answer is because we're essentially sitting in a mushy layer. And where I have high bulk concentration, what happens is I dissolve some of the solid, and I bring the concentration of the liquid back onto the liquidus. So the bulk concentration is going all over the place. The liquid concentration is just sitting on the liquidus, which is tied to the temperature field. And the temperature field is smooth on these length scales. And this is a very slack gradient. And uh, locally, it's approximately just a straight line, which means that salt can diffuse on this gradient through the liquid phase, but only on this gradient, not on these gradients. Okay. The consequence of that is it doesn't really look like a diff uh, diffusive process at all. So here's the equation that we had before from our salt conservation. We're going to neglect any uh, fluid motion for the moment. And we see we can rewrite this equation in terms of the bulk salinity. Okay, So I've written the equation here for the bulk salinity. And what you see is it doesn't depend on gradients of bulk salinity. It depends on gradients of temperature. And actually, if you're thinking of bulk salinity as your primary variable, this is not a diffusion equation. It's a wave equation. It's an advection equation. And what it says is that bulk salinity, 
just translates like a wave of constant form, and it translates at this speed, d, temperature gradient, divided by c, and c I can approximate by tn minus t, and actually this is my migration rate for a brine pocket. This is brine pocket migration, except I haven't talked about pockets. This is just salt conservation. It's just diffusion inside a mushy layer. Okay. So I thought I'd put that there because I think it's a really nice result, and it does show the importance of this process of brine pocket migration, even though that process is a very weak process during growth of, uh, of sea ice. Alan, you might be able to tell me this. Um, so on what I can tell you perhaps more quickly is that over, because we did this for the Emian, uh, over 30,000 years, the, um, it moves about 50 centimeters. Okay? Over 100,000 years, 50 centimeters. Okay? Now, actually, but why is that important? Um, so this is sulfates, and this will tell you something about something, um, uh, typically about volcanism, okay? Uh, so, you know, vo volcanoes put lots of sulf uh, sulfur into the atmosphere, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, you want to do chronology as well. So you want to link events, and, um, and you might want to link it, for example, to global temperature. So temperature, paleo temperature, tends to be measured by measuring um, oxygen isotope ratios. So delta O18 uh, over uh, O16. Okay. Um, this gives you an indication of, of sea surface temperature in, uh, in the ice. And the, uh, the oxygen, most of the oxygen um, molecules, atoms, are sitting in the ice, in the bulk ice. Okay. And so they're moving with the ice, whereas these dissolved species are sitting in the liquid phase. And that so the point is that this will migrate, you know, 50 centimeters relative to the oxygen isotope signal. And so your chronology, you know, given that these are, you know, probably annual layers or something, your, your, your temporal offset uh, is, uh, can be significant, trying to make those correlations. Okay, so that does bring me to the end of, of where I wanted to be today. Um, we've seen that interfacial fractionation is negligible uh, during growth of sea ice. Um, expulsion, uh, while it's a, a real thing and does cause changes in solid fraction, doesn't actually expel. Uh, and brine pocket migration, uh, again, is negligible during growth. Um, on the other hand, there's this nice property that volt salinity signals uh, is it vected? Um, I think it's a rather cute uh, result. And on Friday, we'll talk about the really important mechanism for sea ice, which is brine drainage driven by uh, buoyancy driven convection. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so it's actually a very important question. So one of the reasons we're getting much less ice at, uh, existing in the Arctic at the moment is we have much less multi-year ice. So, you know, the Arctic ice is moving around, it's being blown by the winds predominantly, um, and a distinction is made between first-year ice and multi-year ice, ice that survives to the next season and grows some more. Nearly all the brine rejection happens with, with first year sea ice. Okay, because that's, once you've expelled it, there, there isn't much left uh, to expel. You do, you do all that work in that first season. And so, yeah, you don't have, you may get some additional um, salt movement by brine pocket migration or whatever uh, over longer time scales. But. <coughs> 
let's have some coffee. You can always ask me off at coffee. That's uh, 